I'm so excited to announce the 2020 Energy Intensive with me, Trisha Carr, and my partner, Crystal Ann Compton. The Energy Intensive is an eight-week comprehensive program that teaches and activates energy healing modalities. This program is unique, it is brand new, and it is cutting edge. It's also perfect for anyone who's interested in healing and energy, and particularly for intuitive people, for metaphysical seekers, and for spiritual practitioners. To learn more about the 2020 Energy Intensive, click the link in the description of this episode. Welcome to the Charmed Life Podcast. I am your host, Trisha Carr. I am a spiritual teacher, a clinical hypnotherapist, a medium, and an animal telepath. And I uh, welcome you if this is your first time here. You can watch this on YouTube as a podcast, or you can listen to it on any podcast outlet that you get. I'm on Spotify, you, um, iTunes, um, I, all of the things. I'm on all of the places. And that's my introduction to you today for the podcast in general. And for this specific episode, this is one in a series, kind of a, a theme, a thematic series throughout this podcast that is Metaphysics of the Bible. I have been doing some shorter episodes and some longer episodes here and there. And I, I guess it's open-ended how many episodes I'm going to do of this Metaphysics of the Bible, just as when it, the inspiration strikes me. And so today's episode, well, actually, let me digress a little bit more in case it is your first time listening. The purpose of Metaphysics of the Bible, this particular series within my podcast, is to help us to look at this text that we call the Bible or the Torah. Today we'll be looking at a passage from the Old Testament, aka the Torah, and the purpose for this or the inspiration and in intention beneath it comes from the fact that I was raised, well, actually, I take that back. I wasn't raised. I raised myself in the evangelical Christian church. I say I raised myself because it wasn't something that my family compelled me to do. It was something that I did as a tiny little 11-year-old spiritual seeker. And that was the paradigm that I saw available in my time-space reality to pursue and develop in a spiritual sense. And I stayed with the church until about early adulthood, and then I left. And it's a scary thing to leave a church or to leave a paradigm where you're conditioned that that will cause you to meet some kind of eternal damnation. And yet I did it because the reason I did it was because it wasn't matching up with what I knew the experience of love to be. And what I knew the experience of even God to be or God energy or even Jesus energy that I had a relationship with. And so what was being presented to me through the filters of the different churches I was going to was not line, aligning with that. And so I had to leave. Now, this isn't to diminish or have a judgment about anyone who does choose any particular church, religion, or organized belief system to seek out their spirituality. I think that that does work for a lot of people. Now, so just leave it at that. But now what I am is I am a medium. I am a spiritual teacher. I teach metaphysics. I have a bachelor's degree in metaphysical sciences. And I'm also a hypnotherapist, which is actually quite a metaphysical kind of therapy. Hypnotherapy is, since meta means to work with the energy space or that which is above the physical. And that's what we do with hypnosis and hypnotherapy. And I'm also an animal telepath. When I say I'm a medium, I'm a multidimensional medium, meaning I connect with and communicate with and channel even beings in all of the di different dimensional experiences. So that could be the archangelic realm or the cosmic light realm ancestors, past loved ones, animals, and also the the planes of nature spirits such as the fairy, gnome, sylph, undine, salamanders, unicorns, and dragons. I mean it, y'all, in case you're new to this channel. I'm just giving you a little bit of an overview. And if you're actually a regular listener, you probably just like to hear the words unicorns and dragons and stuff, don't you? 
<laughs> um, anyway, so I was I am inspired to do this because I actually do still draw inspiration from that sacred text that humans created that we call the canon of the Bible. And I actually don't have the occasion of reading it anymore and unless it spontaneously shows up in my awareness and then I will go and visit those passages again. And I, I was actually quite studied in the Bible before. I found, I, I, thought, I feel like this is a, a good practice for any of us in any of Western culture because the Christian story or lore, even if you will, is actually something that we all experience. Even my clients who were raised not specifically Christian or maybe were raised even a different religion like um, Judaism still seem to have some of the conditioning from that perspective that seems to align with the modern day Christianity. And so I don't think that necessarily the conditioning has to do with the true religion uh, or the true spiritual experience of Christianity. And I think that the conditioning that is limiting is something that's just human, just to, to um, put that out there. But I think that it's helpful if you are someone who is metaphysically minded, which is probably why you stumbled to be here. And maybe there is some of that old conditioning whether you were actually in the church or not. And so I think it's good because it's an important or at least influential text, this Bible thing. <laughs> it's a very influential piece of literature in our society. And so that's my inspiration um, in the long and the short of it, if you will. So as passages seem to show up in my own personal and spiritual development or in the ways that I'm working with others, then I... I like to look at the metaphysics behind it, which for me is the universal truth behind it or underneath it. And so this one passage that we're going to talk about today, it actually was stumping me for a while. And so the one that we're talking about is, thou shalt not surely die. It's in Genesis chapter three, in the story um, where the serpent tempts Eve with the fruit and says, did God say you could not eat of any of the fruit in the garden? And Eve said, we can eat of any of the fruit except for the one that's from the tree in the center of the garden and we shall not touch it. She kind of, she got a little um, dramatic about it because she added, we shall not touch it because we will surely die. And the serpent says, thou shalt, you, you will not surely die. And the I'm so accustomed. The original way that I read the Bible was, of course, the King James Version or the New King James Version. So thou shalt not surely die is kind of what is more easily I recall. So you shall not surely die. And then she eats the fruit and then she gives it to Adam. And then they both realize that they're naked and they get scared and so on and so forth. I'm sure you, everyone probably knows this story, but I'm just... Doing a quick recap. Now, I was actually a little bit stumped about this. What is, what, is there any metaphysics? Is there anything that's, that is truth as it concerns human nature? Like why, because one way I look at the, this, it's inspired literature created by humans. I don't think the Bible is fall, infallible. That doesn't even make physical sense because I can tear chapters out of the book and give it to you and say, this is the Bible and they will not spontaneously regenerate. That alone means that it's not, it's not possible for it to be infallible because it goes through the hands of humans with free will who can do, who can rewrite it and change it all they want. I've said that many times in this series. And so, but I, I, I the reason I think there's inspiration there and, and why maybe at some point maybe you, but certainly I found inspiration in it or found spiritual development there in, in these words because there is inspired content in this work because humans are inspired and inspiring. And so I, I wonder, I wondered for a while, is there anything metaphysical, if you want to say, or anything that's inspired or inspiring about this, thou shalt not surely die. I thought about it for a while and it just wasn't coming to me. It wasn't showing up for me. And then 
interestingly, it showed up for me as I was watching this program. This is on Netflix and it's called Sabrina. And it's based on, you know, there was like the sitcom, I think from the 90s or something, Sabrina the Teenaged Witch. And that's the, I think that's, it's a, maybe a graphic novel series. I didn't do my research on that part. I just think, I'm thinking that's what it is. And I started watching Sabrina recently. And I, it, I think we're in, they have two or three seasons now. And I wasn't watching it for a while just because I, I mean, cause I love gothic lore. I, give me a vampire story. I am good. I'm not so interested in zombies, but I mean, because I, I, I like the gothic lore. If you write a good world, like with, with like a through line of the story that makes sense and in their book, you know, meaning like the, the kind of world that they've created, there is, there are, they, they have laws that they validate with one another. So they're always obeying their own story. And, you know, with the lore, like, oh, vampires have to be invited in and stuff like that. And they don't ever violate it. Like that stuff is cool to me. I just I just like it. I've always liked it. And of course, it has to do with witchcraft. And, and that's that's all that's super cool. Right. And magic. I didn't watch it for a while at first because I just thought it was geared toward kids. I thought it was like for teenagers. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, it's probably too silly or something for me. But my best friend, Crystal Ann Compton, recommended it to me. And I was like, oh, well, if you recommend it, I'll watch it. So Sabrina's pretty cool. And if you are someone like me who does come from the church, then and you are you're finding your way out of it. You're detoxing from the dogma. Dogma detox, y'all, maybe for the rest of our lives then you may appreciate it. If you are still sensitive around it, then it could maybe irritate you because it's a little too close to the old dogma. It's just the antithesis to it. Or if you're still sensitive about it, you might be like, whew, that's a little too far for me. Whew. I don't know. I don't know what your experience is. But um, so I'm not, you know, your, your journey will be your own if you choose to watch Sabrina. But what they do in Sabrina is they take the Christian lore and all of the all of the kind of mythic stories and uh, yeah, just I'm just gonna leave it at that. Mythic stories around this these this Christianity thing or the the Bible, and they just kind of flip it on its ear, and they just they really create a world that is just the antithesis of it. And so they call the God of the Bible the false God and things like that, and. I, I think it's really cool how they really went there because there are a lot of people who would be very upset about that. People who are, you know, religious in, in their Christianity. So in their story, in, in Sabrina, there was an episode where they were recounting this story that we're talking about here in the garden and, and recounting it basically from the perspective of Lucifer. And so the, the, there's a woman who's one of the, the aunties and she's reading to children, reading from their Bible, the satanic Bible, and reading how the serpent said that, you know, you you shall not surely die. And then she ate of the fruit and then she closes and she's like, and did she die? And they said, no. And they said, well, then the false God lied to her. And I was like, boom, that was the thing that was always confusing to me. That was the thing that was... I mean, it was confusing to me even when I was in the church. I kind of didn't understand this. So the way it was presented to me while I was in the church was that the serpent lied because he said, you will not surely die. But he was lying because we do die eventually. So in the church, they say, well, they die eventually. So their life would end. Otherwise, they were going to be, they were going to be incarnated forever in the garden. So their bodies were never going to die. And so... I, I'm that when in the Sabrina, when they said, since they didn't die, meaning I guess they didn't die instantly, that means that the the Lord in that in the Bible story lied to them. And I was like, that's an interesting perspective because there is a perspective that that's, you know, you could say that that's accurate because they didn't instantly die. But then, of course, if you interpret it and say, well, they eventually die and they were meant to be physically incarnated forever then it's not a lie. However, it doesn't actually say anywhere in Genesis that they were meant to be physically incarnated forever. So they they kind of, they took some creative license with that, the people that explained it to me. Well, what I'm finding really interesting now, I finally, it, that popped for me, the metaphysics of that. You see, two things happen, is that when 
from the perspective of, well, you were going to be physically incarnated if we make that assumption, because, you know, in that story, God wins, basically. God didn't, they don't say in the actual writing of Genesis that, well, so God was proven wrong. They also don't say they were meant to live forever and they eventually died. They don't say that. We fill all of that in. But if, So let's just give ourselves license to fill that in. And from that perspective, then what I see as the metaphysics here is that when they disobeyed, when they went against unity, when they became disunified by symboli symbolically, in this case, eating from the fruit, then they basically went from their ascension of somehow being fifth dimensional or somehow a trans-dimensional experience or something that is a dimension that wouldn't be in, expressed in third where their bodies would physically die. So they actually descended when they decided to depart from the one will or the one I am in so much as they, they you know, ate of the fruit when they were told that they shouldn't. That was that was the choice. They used their free will choice to leave their ascended position, and therefore they know now they will experience a physical death. And so this perspective makes sense if you think about how they suddenly then realized that they were naked. And it's almost like now they are identifying to their physical bodies, whereas before they either didn't have a totally physical body that was 3D that was going to die, or they didn't experience it in the sense that they were fragile or vulnerable. Naked means vulnerable, right? I mean, it's not just about sh shame. It is, but you feel very vulnerable when you are naked. So there's that perspective. The other slightly different perspective is that that God was, if we, we don't assume that it meant any of that specifically, that they were just physically the beings that they are, 3D. And when God said, you will surely die, or that was the message, that you will die when you eat of this fruit, basically still, again, when you d depart from the unified will or the one will, and you rebel and you try to go outside of it and say, I am more powerful than the I am, then when you do that, when they ate of the fruit, then they became identified to their physical bodies. So this is the knowledge of good and evil. They, what the knowledge of good and evil is telling us about, this is the universal law of cause and effect or the universal law of polarity. Pardon me. Let me, I'm not going to edit that out. I'm just going to say the, the knowledge of good and evil is the activation of the universal law of polarity. It's activating duality. Whereas before they were recognizing one another, but they were all in one unified consciousness, even though they were expressions of the unified consciousness as individuated beings. But when they did that, when they chose to turn their backs on the one will in so much that they, they departed from the flow of creation, then they became identified with duality. They became overly identified to their bodies alone as if they were separate somehow from the all of creation, from the all, uh, the, the all one energy. And so they really, they became, they believed in separation deeply. And so what that led to, and again, that's an activation of, of duality and an identity to the contrast of the one to their being two. And so they, like the deceiver, if we keep it as such in the story, says, you shall not surely die. He was sort of using semantics and saying, you're not going to actually physically die. But what God was saying in this story is that you will believe in death and you will, be, you will be living, while you're living, you will have the experience in your state of death. And what is the experience in your state of death? Well, that is fear. That is worry. That is, is shame. It is somehow judgment, duality. It is um, separating yourself from the flow, from the life, the positive. Let's not say positive. Let's say love or the one consciousness. So they actually were able to be living death by identifying 
to that separation energy. So this is where I see the, the actual, you know, the metaphysics in it. Because metaphysical thought shows us that there is only one moment and therefore there is no such thing as death because there is only one moment from many different perspectives. Time is an illusion, blah, 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 all of that. And so that in that perspective, we will not surely die. And yet we're capable of believing in death by fear, basically, in any moment that we're actually alive from all perspectives, we're alive, even by the 3D physical being incarnated perspective, but I can believe in death at any time, pardon me, but I can believe in death at any time, can't I? So that's how I surely die. We're talking about a rebirth in every single moment and what you're running in your state of being. So what it leads to is a kind of cart before the horse reality belief system that we have now of needing something to be physically true first in order for us to believe or accept it as real. And this is, I say it's cart before the horse because in any law of attraction or any kind of metaphysical manifestation teaching or, you know, process that we understand, we know that that it comes from the frequency that you, the vibration that you're running in order for a frequency, a signal to be sent out. So you are it first in your state before you actually physically manifest something. But we have this almost like disease, call it original sin, if you will, where that is harder for us, that we actually reference outside of ourselves as the authority rather than the reference inside of ourselves. And fast forwarding to Jesus saying that the kingdom of heaven is inside of you, that the I am energy is inside of you, the one energy, the God energy, the source energy, the truth of who you are, your inner being is inside of you. Everything that we that you experience is actually inside of you. It eventually shows up outside of you. But that isn't the authority. That isn't what precedes the truth. It isn't the truer thing about you. It's what is on it is what is in the consciousness. It is the state of being, the state of consciousness. But we have this, like I say, disease that we want to see it to believe it, as Doubting Thomas did. So it is actually always anything that is, the isness of it is always in that I am energy or in the state of consciousness before it becomes matter. Consciousness or energy creates matter, but we seem to think it's the other way around. It's the thing that we're always deprogramming in ourselves. Everything is always first true in energy, in awareness, in consciousness, because consciousness creates matter. Your body doesn't have a soul. Your soul is creating a body. Thus, God, as pure consciousness, creates matter. And it is the God in you, the God energy in you, that is creating matter, creating your events. But the thing is that everything that you experience is you, is is inside of you, is you. And when I say inside, it's just because that's how we kind of experience. We say going within. But in another sense, we're actually, when we go within, we actually connect to the all that is without. And so when when that thou shalt not surely die actually came to be when they ate of the metaphoric fruit, the proverbial fruit, they became deeply, overly identified to the outside form, to the physical. And so that's how they discovered that they were naked. This is how they invented shame. So think of it this way. The 5D awareness or the original awareness before the fruit was eaten of was kind of like the awareness of the video game player. So when you're playing a video game, you're playing and playing, and in the video game is your avatar. And so you're playing along and you're having a good time, and then you're then you die in the video game. But you don't identify to the death of the avatar. You actually kind of get a little excited because you get to start a new game. For a minute, you're like, ah, okay, start over. And so the awareness of the player 
it is the awareness of that God energy or the pure consciousness energy, the seer, as it's said in some, um, I think in Hindu, Hindu practices, they talk about it as the seer. So being the player or the seer of the game is that awakened experience that I imagine you have gone through, which is why you stumbled upon this podcast somehow or another. And being... And when you even being awakened, we still have, we have moments as humans living in this post fruit, eating the fruit uh, era where you overly identify to the avatar of the game. And as the avatar of the game is experiencing its challenges, then we don't have that player perspective, the seer perspective. But the more that we're able to move into that seer perspective, even as challenges come, then we're actually able to be free and fully creative. And this is the awareness of pure consciousness, or as we like to call it, 5D. And so this is how we can modulate it. This is how we can modulate that identity from the over-identification to the physical, to the seer identification. You see, they aren't, uh, they aren't contrary to one another. Actually, the seer position gives us even more appreciation of the physical experience of, the, of that identity. What we do is we actually allow the outside awareness, the awareness of the things that are physical or that which is outside of ourselves to be the inspiration so that we can go within and know that, and know that we are love and know that we are not just loved, but that we are love. We are the energy of love. And then we are kind of consciously detaching from the external identity of it all. Consciously detaching from it is different than detachment or doing it in an unconscious manner, which is evasion or escape. We're talking about consciously detaching from it in love in the way that a parent will consciously detach from overly parenting their child so that their child can figure something out for themselves. You're still appreciating, you're still loving it, and you're still holding space and even giving guidance here and there to that child, but you're not doing it all for them. You're not getting down in their worry and identifying with their worry because that's actually just going to make it worse for the child. You'll be abdicating your position as the help, as the guide, as the authority. And the one who believes that they can make it through, we actually kind of parent ourselves in this way more than kind of, we definitely do. And so what we're really doing is we're being a, a third energy, not of the seer, the three energies here would be the serpent in the, the story in Genesis 3, third chapter Genesis, Genesis, I should say, is the serpent being the deceiver, and that's ourselves, our own deceiver, the fear. The other energy being the human having the experience, the multidimensional being having a human experience. experience. And then the third energy is the pure consciousness, which is represented as God in this story. And you are all of these. All of this is you. And being able to be in that pure consciousness energy is actually the power position. It's neutral. And it creates. It's neutral and dynamic. It's like, again, like a paradox. I say again because it's something that I come across a lot. That third position is where the power is. Being able to appreciate all of it in an unconditional, positive regard. And that is the God view ultimately to be the third energy, which is that seer. And what I also discover in this and in all of the ways that I use metaphysics or mysticism, I see mysticism as a great art that it also helps us to go within. And if in mysticism, in my mysticism, my creative expression and exploration as a mystic includes things like unicorns and dragons and fairies, the archangelic, connecting with past human beings and ascended masters. And the, and the thing is, that is all occurring within me as well, as well as any parallel or past lives. That's all me. That is all my experience. It's, cr it's happening within my being. It's anything is possible. It's all happening within my being. And that doesn't make it less true. That's the that's the problem that we have. We think that if it is just my imagination or happening in my imaginal realm, then it's not true. But it's actually more true because that is the place, that is the seat of creation. 
is that consciousness realm, the pure consciousness, the realm that is we experience by the connection of the imaginal tools. It's all happening within you. And so both are true, that Archangel Michael is a real being of light and that I am creating Archangel Michael within my being. And the reason that second part is true, the, the, the latter is true, is because my relationship, my awareness of and to this being in the universe is my experience that I am creating, that I am allowing. And so all myths are true. All, all mysticism, all myths, all stories are true or can be true, but only by the power of us validating it with our consciousness. And so they both exist without, outside of us, but they also exist within us. But the within experience is the only thing that can be your truth and is the only thing that can connect you to the truth, which is when something is true, it is true from all perspectives. And so only the unconditional can be from all perspectives true. And there we are back again to pure consciousness. Hmm. I should say, rather than saying all myths are true, since I said that when something is true, they're true from all perspectives, let me say that all myths hold reality. All myths reveal a reality. And all truth is within you. So that's, that's my thoughts today on Genesis chapter 3. Oh, actually, there were... There was one other part that seemed a bit metaphysical to me in Genesis chapter 3 where they say that God was walking in the garden or they say the Lord was walking in the garden. And I'm like, hmm, all of a sudden the Lord God walks and is like, it sounds, he's very anthropomorphized. He sounds like a physical being. And so I am suspicious that they're referring to perhaps one of these cosmic races, these star races, that from which we are hybrid. In a few episodes of this metaphysical um, series, Metaphysics of the Bible, I talked about humans being a hybrid race of a few different kinds of star races, or you say ETs, and, you know, Sasquatch and the Archangelic. And if some of you are going like, I'll put a link to... <laughs> that particular episode in the description here. And so I'm thinking when I see that when I see in the text that the Lord God was walking in the garden, I'm thinking that maybe this is one of those beings who were the overarching race, uh, star beings or something like that, rather than it being that pure consciousness experience. Because how does God walk in the garden if God is the all? And it, the way that God does that is by being expressed into some kind of being. So that I just picked up on that a little bit. The Elohim is, uh, you know, let us create man in our image. That's the reference that I'm talking about from the previous episode when I talked about that. All right. So there's something for you to go and think about a little bit if you like. And I hope you enjoyed my perspective and and if you're upset, that's okay too. And if you want to leave a comment or ask a question, you're welcome to. I ask that you leave only comments that are loving. And if they aren't, and if they aren't intended to be helpful, then they'll be deleted. Just because, not because I'm, I'm into, um, you know, suppressing speech. But this isn't a free speech environment. It's the one that I'm creating. And I am creating it for others to connect to, to be inspired and lifted up. But questions are welcome. And um, sharing your experiences are welcome and all of that is welcome if your intention is, is loving. And I do appreciate you so much. Thank you for listening or watching. You guys just make me so, you just bless me so much having this podcast that people are listening to or watching. Wow. It's seriously like my wildest dreams come true. So thank you for that. And if you haven't yet, I would love for you to subscribe, like, share, comment, review the podcast. Really makes my heart glow, helps me to connect with more people, helps us to create more of a community of this awakened experience. And with that, I will say, thanks for tuning in. I love you, whoever you are. Uh -huh.